Okay, um, let's get started. Thank you everybody for tuning in and a warm welcome to our third day of EP Africa Knowledge Week. Uh, my name is Lotta Wilkman. I'm a portfolio coordinator at EP Africa and joining you today from Helsinki, Finland. It's a um, pleasure to host this session and it's great to see that we already have a nice audience um, logged in. So um, this session is a part of our four-day Knowledge Week. Um, we have already had two webinars. On Monday, we'd ha we had a discussion around cooling as a service, featuring some of our portfolio companies operating with the cooling value chain. And yesterday, we had a session on leadership and inclusive energy transition, where we also opened the stage to our um, newly awarded EP 2021 Rising Energy Leaders. And our Knowledge Week will end tomorrow. My colleagues will present some early results from our upcoming EP study on what makes grant-funded projects successful. There will be both EP project developers and uh, investors discussing the topic. And um, the final highlight of the week will be, of course, the crowning of the EP Africa Project of the Year 2021. Uh, the media partner for this series of events is ESI Africa. And today we will talk about powering agro-processing and this is how our agenda looks like. First, we will um, have Tanya Kothari from Shell Foundation and she will provide the framing remarks uh, based on her research in, in agro-energy nexus. And then after Tanya's presentation, I will introduce our three um, panelists who will briefly present their companies and their approach to agro-processing and then we will have a couple of um, follow-up questions and discussion to get more specific insights from each of them. And at, at any time, if someone in the audience has a question to any of our speakers, please use the chat box on the on the sidebar of your screen and type your questions there as, as you go. And, um, and please also specify who the question is targeted to if, if that's possible. We have a tight one hour session and about five to 10 minutes at the end is reserved for Q&A, of course, depending on how, how excited we get with the discussion. And also I'm reminding you that there's, um, there's a handouts folder next to the chat box where you can find some EP Africa publications, the latest issue of ESI Africa magazine, and also some, some material from our speakers. Um, to keep this session a little bit more interactive, we have a few polls for the audience and we will start with an easy and quick one. We would like to know from which part of the world you are um, joining this webinar. I'll let it open for a few seconds. This should be a very, very easy one, doesn't require too much thinking. I think that's enough. We can close the poll and get the results. So clearly, um, biggest representation from, from Africa and Europe. Um, no one from Middle East and North Africa. Some, um, some audience from Asia or, or America. Let's see if they're like, I don't know if they're early birds or very enthusiastic uh, clean energy people from from the Americas who are joining as it's very early for them. But anyway, uh, everybody welcome once again. Uh, I believe most of our listeners have uh, have already been engaged with EEP in one way or another. But, um, but for those who are not familiar with what we do, I will start by saying a few words about EEP Africa. So primarily EEP provides grant financing to early stage clean energy companies across a, a wide range of technologies and business models from all kinds of solar PV solutions, uh, clean cooking, small hydropower, waste to energy, biogas, etc. And currently in our active portfolio, we have close to 70 companies from all over our focus region that covers 15 countries in Southern and East Africa. 
And uh, in addition to funding, we also provide support services in business development and investment facilitation to our portfolio companies. And our team is also engaged in uh, knowledge management, producing studies and, and facilitating partnerships in the sector. EP Africa is an open-ended multi-donor trust fund. It's managed and, and hosted by the Nordic Development Fund. And uh, the funding comes from, from NDF itself, from Finland and Austria. And since the launch of EEP a little bit more than 10 years ago, over 50 million euros in total have been invested in, uh, in these projects with some quite impressive achievements. And the overview of the results is available on our EEP Africa website. Then a very quick glance to our portfolio. As you can see, a majority of our portfolio companies are considered startups, so we really target the early stage businesses. Close to 50% are local African companies, and around a third of all companies are led by women. So that's in very much in line with our priorities. We're not funding exclusively off-grid sector, but a, but a handful of the projects are classified as on-grid or grid-connected. And the, the share of mini-grid projects is currently 16%. Uh, the pro productive use of energy projects represent uh, an increasing share of our portfolio, currently a bit over 50% have some kind of a productive use uh, component and a large part of them are, are uh, linked to the agricultural value chains. And our, our speakers and our guest panelists today are great examples of uh, companies promoting and, and accelerating productive use of energy in, in different ways. And there is great diversity in terms of technologies and, and geographies and business models from solar powered uh, standalone systems for irrigation uh, milling, cooling, egg incubation, and also some uh, biomass power drying, and then um, integrated mini grids, and for example, uh, waste to energy projects that work very closely with uh, with farmers in in rural communities. And EP Africa produces every year an in-depth study on a topic um, that has gained uh, attention and and a lot of interest in the clean energy sector. And we use the data and, uh, and lessons learned collected from the field by our project developers. And in the past three years, we have focused on mini grids, productive use of energy and climate resilience. And today we would like to bring all these three topics to the table with a specific focus on agro-processing and on, on how the farmers can improve their productivity and, and increase their revenues with the with uh, different kinds of appliances and services powered by, by renewable energy. And uh, now I will give the floor to our first guest, Tanya Kothari, who will provide the framing remarks for the discussion. So Tanya is the research and advocacy manager at Shell Foundation and currently leading the uh, CASEE project, which, which stands for Catalyzing Agriculture by Scaling Energy Ecosystems. So over to you, Tanya. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and good morning to whoever is uh, joining from Europe. Um, thank you, Lota, for the introduction, and thank you for having me here today to share the learnings from our KC program. Um, so uh, before jumping into it, I'll start with a quick introduction to Shell Foundation. If you can move to the next slide. So um, Shell Foundation is a UK registered charity and we exist to support people living in low income communities um, to escape poverty and ease their hardship. And we do this through supporting early stage enterprises uh, very uh, similar to EP Africa. Um, and we create and scale these business solutions uh, that access um, uh, that that enhance access to energy and sustainable transport for these low income customers. Um, next slide, please. So I'm sharing this model because this is something we really believe in to catalyze um, early stage sectors, or similar to uh, basically what, what agro-processing is. It's, it's a very nascent sector 
um, uh, at FarmGate for uh, in emerging economies. So we believe that there are four parameters that are really needed to scale these uh, early stage sectors. And all of these four parameters need to come together and stakeholders need to catalyze all these four parameters um, uh, in, a in, a, in a coordinated manner. Um, so these are uh, building demand, uh, really understanding the customer needs uh, and building out that demand side, um, growing supply, so making sure that there are uh, market pioneers, the, the kind of companies that we support, basically, that are able to meet the supply um, side um, um, needs um, to meet, meet the demand needs. Um, there is obviously institutional support to then scale these solutions. Um, and then there is access to finance, which is often the missing uh, piece of the puzzle um, in, in the sectors that we're working in. So um, since 2019, we have applied this model to the agriculture sector in our partnership KC, um, uh, through, which is a partnership with FCDO. So if you can go to the next slide. So in our program KC, uh, it's, which is a 30 million pound energy and agriculture program, um, which is a partnership with FCDO, we believe that energy access is extremely important in strengthening the agricultural ecosystem um, to increase uh, food security and production. And we support startups to scale by providing um, them with funding and hands-on business support um, to expand renewable energy access for productive use. And a very important subsector for us is agro-processing in this. For example, we are supporting value addition and dehydration uh, through solar and energy efficient dryers with S4S technologies in India. And we are supporting oil processing powered by waste uh, through origin in Kenya. Um, so this is kind of solving the supply side of the issue. Uh, we also focus on generating robust evidence on the role of patient capital and pathways to scale and really understanding customer needs, which meets some of the demand side challenges and the ecosystem um, challenges. And one of our key goals is to mobilize uh, additional leverage into the sector, uh, which is trying to solve for the uh, access to finance side of the issue. So we're, we're trying to tap uh, all four aspects to the, through this program. Um, so since we have a range of experts in the panel today who are solving supply supply challenge, I'm sorry, I'm going to allow in our office, I'm just make myself for a second. Sorry, that was just a test that happens every Wednesday. So um, yeah, so uh, since we have a range of experts in the panel today uh, who will be talking about the supply uh, side challenge for energy as well as productive agro-processing assets, I'll primarily focus on sharing uh, evidence that has come from KC this year. Um, so one of those pieces of research looks at issues of demand and the perspective of the customer, uh, in this case, which is the rural household. And the other piece of research shares learnings from multiple demand stimulation pilots that were conducted by one of our partners, Factory. Um, and these were all pilots conducted in the energy ag nexus. And one of them uh, was, a couple of them actually were done on agro-processing. So I share some learnings around that. If you can move to the next slide now. So um, the Rural Pathways research uh, we published earlier this year, and the basic message of uh, the, the basic intent that we need to drive, that we want to drive uh, through this report is that successful and inclusive rural economic development cannot happen through a one-off project or a one-off pilot or, or looking at customers' need today, but it needs to be built on a long-term understanding and engagement with rural households. This just doesn't um, help with impact. It obviously helps with impact because you're addressing not just the present needs, but anticipating the future needs based on the aspirations of rural households. But it also helps with sustainability of businesses because they have then a long-term relationship with the customers, which drives recurring revenue, and it's, it's better for everyone, basically. So this report provides us a structure to map these long-term needs and provide some practical recommendations to all stakeholders working with rural all stakeholders working with rural households and which the energy agri nexus and the agro-processing sector is. Um, so this report that we published this year uh, in partnership with uh, Rafael was built on the rural pathways model which laid out uh, seven different pathways that are shown here um, that households might take as they pursue different livelihood strategies in order to meet their needs and aspirations and in order to increase their incomes, their resilience and their agency. And this model basically shows us that rural households aren't static 
customer segment. They're not just one small holder farmer customer segment, but they're all very different with nuanced needs. And they're a dynamic customer segment with evolving needs, which needs to be taken into account in building long-term theories of change and investment thesis while investing in the sector. So I'm going to focus on what we learned from our primary research conducted in Kenya with more than 1,200 rural households. And I'm going to focus on just the pathway 4B and 5, which is the rural services entrepreneurship segment, because uh, these are the, the kind of customers that the agro processing sector needs to focus on and understand closely because they're directly linked. Um, and why I, why I say this is because, for example, uh, from our research in Kenya, we found that business oriented households in pathways four and five will prioritize investment in equipment, smaller productive assets and uh, business stock. And they rely actually on their ability to own and operate um, productive assets like processing machinery and storage facilities uh, to earn income and to build their resilience um, and agency. So um, they invest in these assets and more than 50% or actually or nearly 50% of these households plan to purchase these productive assets, these agro-processing assets through credit. So this also highlights to us the importance of access to finance or uh, asset finance specifically, because not all of them have the savings to be able to afford these assets, but they're really looking to make these investments to grow their businesses. So it's not just that they need access to the assets, but we also saw evidence of how these access to agro-processing assets can actually act as a powerful enabler for them to progress forward. Uh, for example, um, households in pathway 4 um, that reported that their business income had increased in the previous three years identified better equipment as one of the major reasons for their success. So this shows us the power of um, the sector in, in improving livelihoods. Um, their use of mechanized equipment also means that affordable and reliable energy becomes a critical enabler for them. And nearly 50% of Pathway 4 households identified energy access as a challenge for their business growth. That shows us the importance of energy as well as assets, as well as finance, so everything linked together. Um, we also found that diesel and petrol are the most common energy sources for powering um, larger equipment. And this is because of lack of access to reliable and cheap, affordable energy. Um, more than 50% of all path as well as plant purchases of pathway 4 are or will be powered by uh, diesel um, and petrol. And this is all data from Kenya. Obviously, this will vary from geography to geography, but this just shows us the extent of the problem uh, for them. Um, and pathways 4 and 5 tend to view energy cost and low reliability of energy as a major obstacle to their growth, which was more than 50% of both pathways, so a huge percentage. And another challenge that exists for the sector is obviously on just the imbalance uh, in terms of gender. So in pathways four and five, uh, women tend to be concentrated in the lower value sectors with lower barriers to entry and upfront investment. Uh, women and men have had similar rates of ownership of agro dealers, agro vets and aggregators, but women were 10% less likely to own agro processing businesses because they require larger upfront investment in terms of asset finance. And so this again throws a challenge to the um, asset providers and asset financing uh, players to solve the problem differently for women. Um, so this is all data and the type of, and this was type of insight that we were able to generate through primary data in Kenya. But this means that this shows us that a range of interventions is required um, and only access to energy or access to assets or access to credit is not going to solve the problem. There needs to be collaboration in the sector. So uh, key players in the sector need to design better consumer research to understand these needs and how the dif these different um, uh, enablers can play different roles at different times for customers and how they need to work together uh, through developing more effective collaboration. And then definitely needs to be a longer theory of change uh, in looking at customers and their needs uh, going forward uh, to, to define how investments today can, can influence business decisions for tomorrow as well. So um, this was uh, the demand side and what we learned. And there's a QR code if you want to access the full report. It's on our website. Um, we can move to the next slide, please. So um, this was a research report that, that was published by uh, a partner factory who developed a program of demonstration projects to generate evidence and uh, understand how to ac accelerate rural development through better access to energy and agriculture. And some of the key learnings that they had from um, these pilots were that the opportunity in the sector is very exciting. There is an opportunity definitely for demand generation um, uh, for mini grids through uh, anchoring loads through um, uh, productive uses such as agri-processing. 
uh, as they were able to see improved IRRs for mini grid operators for some of the pilots, not all, but but there is an opportunity. And as from a pilot, as these turn into longer term projects, there can be better data and evidence around that. But the model is not straightforward. Um, mini grids need to be planned where high value commercial uh, agricultural opportunities exist and can drive uh, rural economic growth. So this will need the key players in the sector to deeply understand customers and plan projects around their long term needs. Um, and everyone will need to come together. So um, the other uh, learning that they had was that uh, potential partners need to agree viable tariff structures upfront, because if you look at it from the perspective of an agro processing business, for them, uh, energy is just a service. And if they don't get uh, access to affordable, reliable energy, easily available from mini grids, they are going to turn elsewhere, which is in the current case, as we've seen, they're turning diesel gensets as backup. Um, the third was that obviously all the onus doesn't lie on mini grid operators. Um, there needs to be more evidence generated for it to make commercial sense for all parties involved. And so there needs to be, need to be many more pilots and data shared around uh, the viability of, um, of, of agro processing as, as, as an anchor load uh, for the sector. And uh, there obviously needs to be more, more sharing of learnings between all stakeholders involved. And then the fourth important thing was that most of these agri-energy opportunities, including agro-processing, um, include multiple players. So one player would be an energy services provider, one would be uh, an agri-business uh, which is interested in, um, in, in getting involved in agro-processing, and the third would be a technology solution which would be an agro-processing asset provider or an asset finance provider. So all of these different organizations, it's going to be hard for all of them to come together without strong incentives for each of them which currently uh, aren't really proven and don't exist so the role of matchmakers is really important and that's where we think uh, the role of grant and philanthropy uh, is important um, they should help pull these projects together and then the public sector and private sector can get involved at scale uh, to create commercial incentives at scale uh, for these markets so um, in conclusion i'd just like to say that this is a very important and fast growing sector uh, low carbon agri tech enterprises are addressing uh, a very big bottleneck to growth in rural economies, which is energy access and reliability. Uh, and in Africa, as urbanization continues and food demands of cities increase, demands for industries like agro processing and, and transportation and logistics um, will continue to grow. Work in post harvest uh, agri value chains uh, like wholesale logistics processing and agri retail, uh, which is overwhelmingly um, um, currently done by SMEs. It already accounts for 40% of non-farm employment and 25% of all employment in Africa uh, from an agra uh, research. Um, as you will hear from the panelists today, uh, innovative enterprises like their own are creating entire value chains uh, because there aren't other collaborators or partner partners present um, to provide access to energy and reduce waste through agro processing. But these solutions are very under-resourced and do need access to more capital and finance. And uh, I hope that in today's discussion, we're able to find some of the solutions uh, to tackle some of these barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much for your words. This is very interesting. And I'm, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of food for thought to our listeners about truly understanding the the rural pathways and, and the, the consumer behavior. I'm also sure that Tanya's words on um, uh, on these uh, ag energy nexus opportunities for mini grid developer, developers will will be reflected by our panelists. But at this point, we can launch our second poll, uh, and let's see if Tanya's presentation has affected your views. So, what what do you believe is the biggest barrier for a wider adoption of renewable energy powered agro-processing appliances. Cost, affordability, poor fit for purpose for farmer needs, availability slash seasonality, lack of product awareness or trust, or lack of financing. Okay, let's, um, let's keep it a few more seconds. Yeah, I guess we could get the results so we can move on. Uh, so cost affordability and lack of financing, obviously they are uh, very much um, interlinked. So lack of financing for the for the whole sector is one 
one barrier and then the cost and, and affordability at the customer level. So this is quite an, an animals um, in a way, and it's a clear, clear message to, to EEP also and, and other initiatives in the sector. So there is a clear funding gap. But let's move on. I will now welcome our three inspiring entrepreneurs and let them present themselves and, and their work uh, in this uh, Ag Energy Nexus and, and Powering Agriculture. We have uh, Ricardo Ridolfi from uh, CEO and co-founder of Equatorial Power, Matt Carr, co-founder and CEO of Axel, and Peter Nyake, co-founder and managing director of Mandulis Energy. They all have um, operations mostly in uh, East Africa, but they offer quite different um, range of products and, and services. So now, gentlemen, you can um, you can all turn on your cameras, uh, and while you're introducing your your business and your EP project, I would like you to also uh, possibly reflect on Tanya's words and and also tell us about who your customers are and how you have defined your customer segments. And first, I will give give the floor to Ricardo, please. Thank you, Lotta. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, EEP has always been a great supporter and uh, we'll, we'll stay forever loyal. But um, jo jokes aside, I mean, Tanya's presentation was in, was key because as far as we're concerned, I mean, uh, by the way, Equatorial Power, very briefly, is a, is a de decentralized energy infrastructure developer. So mini grids is one way to put it. But the truth is we want to power any decentralized asset that offers a service using energy. We don't really quite care about electrons, to be honest. We care about you know, lighting and mainly processing. And if you consider that most of our customers being peri-urban and rural um, have, you know, some kind of agricultural interest, um, you know, the agro uh, agro energy nexus is by far the most important pillar underpinning our business. So um, very briefly, I mean, what distinguishes Equatorial Power is that, again, we go beyond electricity to an integrated approach um, where we have a generation and distribution uh, of power. We have our own productive hubs, mainly for water purification, ice making, and we do our own processing. And then through partnerships, we offer appliance and asset financing. Um, and yeah, would, would love to tell you a little more. Is this just a brief intro or should I go a little bit deeper, uh, Lotta? You can go a little bit deeper, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, yep, cool. So, um, so as I was saying, I mean, we, as Tanya said, for the site identification part, that's where we, we begin looking at beyond electricity. I mean, uh, in the last 10 years, we've all been building mini grids, asking people how much power they think they would use, but it's effectively, you know, you're, you're based, building a baseline based on an aspirational uh, commodity, which is largely not present. Um, so we've changed that drastically a few years ago, and we started looking at just the agro processing potential. Uh, first of all, with substitution, but also uh, with substitution of of distance, meaning that oftentimes there's no processing in place, but people import things, right? And we work on islands and rural areas. A little bit of a difference because, well, fishing islands obviously uh, produce and then export where well, they fish and they export the fish. So they, there's a lot of ice imported, and that makes for a very nice, neat substitution effect. And in rural areas, it, it's more about uh, basic processing. Um, again, lacking. So we've done a lot of research and collected a lot of data in terms of what is the potential of that site or that hub, because when we roll out a portfolio, then it, it suffices to have one centralized hub. And, and we've seen that, uh, truth be told, that that really makes the DNA of our systems. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the amount of economic growth that you can generate that really matters. Um, our, I think our common currency here is the customer. And these are customers that are largely poor. Uh, but have a, have a lot of a potential to express, not just in terms of energy consumption and how much they can pay you in terms of electricity, but how much they can grow and pay you in terms of a plethora of services that they need. And that is really how we would identify our niche, and that's what we've focused our efforts on. Um, we're mainly off-grid, where we build integrated systems. We're now going beyond productive use and looking at, well, I suppose it's still in a way productive use, but we're looking at uh, electric mobility. We rolled out our first electric boats and motorcycles. Um, we're trying to commission larger projects. We just commissioned a 600 kilowatt mini grid connecting five villages. Um, and, and really it's that sort of micro scale that allows us to, to take full advantage 
of uh, productive use, right? At the end of the day, um, we try and centralize as much as possible. And then through partnerships, uh, we, we work uh, with Energrow a lot. Energrow is actually a, a productive use asset finance company. I believe it's also an EEP portfolio company. Um, we work with the Aussie Foundation, with uh, N Ventures, and you know, we'd love to work with Axel too. I mean, I'll just throw it out there for Matt. But truth is, we, we, can, we can never get enough. I mean, we want to do as much as possible in terms of developing the community. And, and, and we re to, to us, it's really a 20-year play. Um, so what else can I say about Tanya's report? I mean, we've been working with the Shell Foundation for a long time, luckily. Um, we, you know, like EEP, there's certainly a, a, one of the key pillars in terms of support in the sector. We do think a little bit more is needed. And um, the truth is there's, there's still a bit of a disconnect um, and I don't think that's because of foundations. I think that's mainly driven by investors. You know, you're either ag or energy. Whereas in the in the rural area, I think all of us will agree that that distinction should not be made. Um, and we're we're often opportunistic necessarily. You know, you follow the money, you try and build a business, and so inevitably you follow the financing. And it is very difficult. You know how many times uh, I've had pushback from investors saying, "Well, you know, do you sell electricity or do you do you make ice cream? You know, you're an ag company or you make ice cubes." Truth is, you've got a whole lot of problems to solve. And if electricity can be the sort of feel rouge uh, touching all of that, then, then so be it. And that's, that's how we try, we're trying to redefine our business model today. And perhaps I'll pause there, but I look forward to engaging uh, with Peter and Matt. Thank you a lot. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. That was wonderful. And we will talk about partnerships and there's already one connection uh, made during this, uh, this session. So um, next up, Matt. Please go ahead. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Lata. Um, and uh, yeah, Ricardo, we'll have a, a chat afterwards. <laughs> um, look, yeah, um, thanks everyone. My name is Matt Carr from Axol. I'm, I'm here in Kenya, and we design and manufacture um, super efficient grain mills for off-grid applications. Also, just want to you know start off by saying you know EP have been a real champion of ours. Um, you know, EP have a high risk tolerance and, you know, they got, they got on board and got behind us uh, uh, two and a half years, three years ago. And, um, you know, we, we wouldn't exist today if it, if it wasn't for EP. Um, you know, just echoing a bit of the sentiment already kind of said, we started down this road a few years ago, um, recognizing that, you know, it's not electrons, that's the solution. It's really what electrons do. And, and given that most people that don't have electrons um, depend on agriculture for their livelihood, you know, that's where we um, you know, really focused our attention. And then specifically that focus was on agro-processing machines because um, one, you know, there's a, there's a ubiquitous need for, for agro-processing in rural areas. Um, people are often smallholder farmers, they're all subsistence farmers. They depend on agriculture and their milling options that they have available to them, you know, create real hardship. And so when I'm talking about milling options, the, you know, the, the industry standard in rural areas is a diesel mill. Um, and, you know, that, that diesel mills, they're, they're big, expensive machines. They're um, difficult to install. They've got really high operating costs. They're, there's quite a lot of technical uh, know-how to operate and maintain them. And, um, you know, because of that, they're typically only found in larger, larger villages or market centers. And then the knock-on effect of that is that, you know, people that need to access them, they, you know, smallholder farmers, and it's typically women, you know, end up spending hours and walking miles every week carrying heavy sacks of grain to and from diesel mills just to pay for a pretty substandard milling service that leaves their, um, the flour that they eat uh, with a taste and smell of diesel fumes. So, you know, it's a big problem. You know, we, we, we estimate that collectively diesel mills are the largest stationary use of energy in rural areas. Um, we know that there's at least half a million of them in, in East Africa. And, you know, on our best estimates, you know, there's billions of hours of women's time, you know, being wasted just accessing these essential services. Um, you know, we've really been in product development mode for the last uh, few years um, to try to crack the code on, on, you know, making a product that makes sense in the market. Um, you know, making a, a solar powered mill, which is kind of what, you know, we, has been our, our focus, um, is not so technically challenging, um, but to make one that, that makes sense from a business perspective, from the customer's business perspective, is immensely challenging. And the, the big reason for that, you know, often when we've kind of talked about productive use and, 
you know, we, we often get lumped with pump, the pump guys and, and refrigeration, but milling always deals or agro-processing always deals, um, or at, at least our level of kind of agro-processing, which is staple food processing, you know, that's the lowest value food crop in the agricultural value chain and the margins are, are tiny. Um, and uh, so therefore to make a product that makes sense, it's, um, it, it's complicated. Um, anyway, just uh, through many kind of product uh, iterations and market tests and more iterations, you know, we're kind of feeling we've, we've you know, finally, um, you know, cracked the code on, um, on, on a product that makes sense in the market. Um, it's still in prototype format. Uh, we call it the the micro mill, and it's been specifically designed for solar. But you know we can also power it off off mini grids or, or grid or even e bikes, or it can be run around on the back of a motorbike uh, as a mobile milling solution with rechargeable batteries. Um, it's incredibly easy to use. So that that technical know how about using a mill, we've we've taken that out of the you know the user uh, requirement and kind of built the smarts into the mill to handle that. Um, in solar format, it's cheaper than diesel mill. In AC format, it's cheaper than equivalents. And and the and the big thing we've been striving towards to, for it to make sense for as a solar milling product is efficiency. And we have a mill that's now two and a half times more efficient than a typical off-the-shelf small electric grain mill. Um, and that's a you know that's that's a important because in in solar format that means it needs a whole lot less solar power uh, and batteries etc. to to run it. Um, it's powered by an 800 watt VLDC motor. Um, for the mini grid guys, that means there's no inrush current, which is uh, particularly important for you. And um, you know we're in the process of uh, you know we're we're just kind of moving from the uh, fuel trials. You know they've they've gone really well, and we're just in the process of man manufacturing the first batch of 100 of those mills, which we will have ready for market in uh, March next year. So I'll pause there and hand it back to you. Thanks very much, Lotta. Okay, excellent, Matt. Thank you very much. And then finally, we have Peter from Mandulis Energy. Peter, please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Ricardo. Hi, Matt. Great to connect again, Lotta. Uh, yeah, so at Mandulis, we once again also look you know, beyond electrons and we focus both uh, on the off-grid side of power generation from clean sources and the grid connected side as well. And our main focus is in making sure our energy that's produced is as affordable as possible. So on the grid side, uh, we're developing a really large 20 megawatt project that uh, will be online soon and um, will be powering a, a large city in Northern Uganda. On the off-grid side, uh, we're developing uh, over 20 smaller mini grids, I'd say smaller than the large grid size, but they're still they're around the 500 kilowatt uh, mark. And um, at that kind of range, it's possible to get the kind of scale we need to make sure that the price of electricity off grid is the same as the price of electricity on grid uh, without going through you know additional uh, subsidies and so on and so forth. So we we try our very best to make sure that. Uh, agricultural processing establishments that are off-grid can access the same quality of electricity off-grid as their competitors would on the grid in the urban areas because in the end the big large buyers like your coca-colas of this world need the same quality of product and to get that quality of product to them you've, you've got to be able to power those uh, facilities at that same rate and, um, and that's really what we've been pushing for a lot. And we're really grateful to EEP Africa for supporting us in uh, scaling up um, our first 500 kilowatt biogas uh, power project, which will be up and running next year. We've been focusing beforehand on gasification on solar, uh, but we're looking at, uh, at biogas marrowing digestion as well. So we don't only look at uh, those communities that have dried waste, but also those that have uh, you know, wet agriculture waste. But it's all about you know, looking at what we can do for the communities that we serve. If we can help them increase their incomes from agriculture, from say, you know, about a hundred euros a ton of product to three times as much by making sure that they're competitive against, you know, um, other equivalents across the country, it becomes quite interesting. So we're working in Uganda at the moment 
Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, replicating the same uh, way of doing things uh, in other parts of uh, the continent as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was that was great. Um, so very interesting companies with a lot of potential to contribute to the agriculture and energy nexus. Um, before we go into the follow-up questions with the panelists, we have prepared one more poll for the audience. So, um, what type of productive use appliances for agriculture are needed most? So, I mean, which one of these activities or or appliances would have the the biggest impact in the lives of the farmers, or or which appliances um, powered by uh, renewable energy sources and replacing diesel or or manual work should have wider availability at, at affordable price. So we um trying milling slash grinding slash pressing, egg incubation, pasteurizing, and then um, cooling and storage. Let's pull out the results. So that was uh, uh, lots of votes for for cooling and and storage facilities and uh, as mentioned, we had a uh, we had a session on Monday about cooling, cooling as a service. So for those who are interested, the 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 recording of that webinar will be available on the on the EP Africa website or or I think on our probably our YouTube channel. But also there's um there's demand for for milling, grinding, and pressing solutions. Thank you for the call. So we um um. We can get back to our guests and uh, we will start again with Ricardo. You actually already touched upon these questions uh, in your um, first uh, introduction. So you have um, you have developed mini grid projects both in kind of these traditional rural village settings, but also uh, in islands on, on Lake Victoria and currently in a joint venture with uh, NG Energy Access in the EP project. So the Lolwe Island, project recently won the AFSIA award for the best mini grid project. Uh, congratulations on that. And um, and with EP funding, you're planning to replicate that on, on smaller islands. So what are the, the biggest differences between mini grids in, in rural or island settings? If you think about the customer base beyond households, for instance, fishing uh, versus other agricultural activities. Uh, so what are the differences in ener energy needs and, and consumption patterns? And then the second question, um, I know that you're a well-connected man with the kind of mini hats yourself. So uh, you can also tell the audience about the, the partnerships you have established um, kind of in order to stimulate more demand for electricity among many great customers. With pleasure, Lotta. Thank you. Um, so just to give a, a quick idea, I mean, currently, we are operating six sites across Uganda, Rwanda, and DRC for a total of about 5,000 smart meters. And um, I would say they're about, the bulk of them are on island sites. In terms of uh, EEP funding, you're right, it's uh, to replicate it to 15 more island sites. And we are working on another 15 in the DRC area to bring us to roughly 23,000 connections, hopefully this time next year. Now, in terms of what we've observed and learned over the last four years is that um, islands do make up, well, they're a natural mini grid, right? They're naturally uh, disconnected, but islands also, you know, um, for the good or the worse, have a higher commodity prices. So people are already used to paying a lot for things, which makes a substitution easier. Secondly, there's quite a strong economy in terms of, at least in Lake Victoria, much more than Lake Kivu and Congo, in terms of fishing, which means that um, there is more income. Um, and last but not least, uh, it's all based around the fishing industry, which means the bulk of their revenue is fishing and exporting this fish. Therefore, what that means for us is that it is much easier to predict sizing. It is easier to focus on water purification and ice making. Uh, to give an idea of size, on Lolwe, we have an industrial size water purification machine and four, four 10 ton ice making machines. And then we have a 40 foot container to dry silverfish. So it's a 
pretty big like industrial hub, if you will. And this is because you know the island was well suited for that. But but in general, islands make for a very nice case in terms of the simplicity of how we can counterbalance. And I should say, last but not least, I mean, ice and cold in general makes for a good natural battery, which means we're able to correlate supply and demand quite well, uh, meaning less waste and therefore lower LCOE, lower tariff. So this is the, the island sort of ideal case. If you bring that into our experience in rural areas is that it's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more tailor-made, uh, not lastly because there, at some point there is a village nearby where some processing is happening, which means you're now competing with the distance substitution effect, um, which is easier when, when you're on the mainland than when you're on island. So that's the caveat. I mean, there the bulk of activity, at least in our areas, is a little bit around the, the milk uh, value chain and quite a lot around the grains value chain. Uh, very little else, at least where we are, um, which means it is a little bit more challenging because you need a more tailored approach. And that's why uh, that's why I was saying that you know we'd, we'd love to work with Matt and and others like Axel that specialize in that. We realize our limitations. I mean, we, as many other mini grid companies, we started. Um, asset financing appliances, right? And and it was it was it was great. We had a thirty to forty percent growth uh, over the first nine months, and we realized that it's essential, but it's insufficient alone. Which is why we went into sort of bigger processing ourselves. And then we decided that in scale we would not be able to do asset financing efficiently. And uh, that's how Energrow was born. And Energrow focuses on that because essentially our DNA is to deploy infrastructure and to operate infrastructure with a, with an obsession on the client. But it's not to be a finance company. Whereas uh, you know you need that in scale to get efficiencies and translate those efficiencies to pricing. So that was that was a very interesting partnership for us. We also partner with a number of NGOs that that are capillary uh, in rural areas. I repeat, I mean we realize that we are not ag experts. Um, we we can get infrastructure built and we can operate clients in remote areas and the most remote areas, but we're not great at building up that agro value chain. I mean, uh, what what do I want for Christmas or my birthday or whatever it is? I'd love a partner that goes deeper into the value chain and says, hey, not only will I help you roll out machines, but I'm going to help you help your customers get closer to the market because often there are um, there are middlemen that make the bulk of the profit. And the ultimate benefit, you know, the ultimate our customer is losing most of the value. And so, if there's a way that we could, for example, with a fishing value chain, uh, have a factory that gives them some special type of pricing in exchange for certain quality of fish, just to, you know, say something, or a direct access to market for processed products, that would be that's the next step. But obviously, it's not our business, right? So we do think that partnerships, both vertically and horizontally. So uh, NG is a great partner. They're obviously a huge company. And with them, we're able to deploy more mini grids and more scale. So that's the use. But then laterally, we need partners that can help us build an ecosystem. Because the only way that uh, everybody wins is if these communities develop quicker. And so that's why there's a, there's a sort of beautiful alignment of interest. Um, yeah, I, as I said, another very, very interesting use case, less relevant for ag, but it's electric mobility. And I think, uh, you know, that's something not to be ignored. And we're finally seeing a bunch of companies being funded there. So um, as Equatorial Power, we, we've spent quite a bit of time. I mean, this is my second spell in mini grids. It's been eight years now. So there's a lot of work that has been done off grid. And, and we've realized that one last key pillar is fundamental for us, and that is interaction or integration with the grid. At the end of the day, um, universal access will not be sustainable if you don't have a national sustainable energy system. And as you know, I sit on the board of Umeme, which is supposed to be a well-functioning utility. I mean, I don't want anyone from Uganda making a comment. I mean, they, we do have power cuts, but the point being that you know, within the constraints, uh, we, we do well, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult, um, especially for utilities, to be profitable in rural areas. So, But at the end of the day, you have to zoom out and you have to see the national energy system as one because otherwise somebody's paying for that gap. And unfortunately, the truth is most governments can't afford to keep subsidizing. And um, anyway, this is a longer discussion, but, but we have therefore spent a lot of time working on the fringe of grid to see how we can support operations there. And, and it's really only around agro-processing and demand growth. That's the bulk. Of course, there's some community engagement and some localized ops, but it comes down to exploiting and further exploring the energy ag nexus. I think that's a good cue for my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo.
um, yeah, that's definitely uh, very, very interesting for, for your colleagues to, to hear. Uh, then we can um, uh, go to, to Matt. So um, uh, you have developed um, Axel's um, first models of solar mills already years ago, and you have explored many, many different systems and, and adapting, adapting the, the design and technology along your journey. Uh, as far as I understand, from um, retrofitting diesel generators with solar panels and then introducing this uh, fully standalone solar mill and, uh, and, and now partnering with, uh, with mini grids too. So, so tell us a bit about what lessons you have uh, learned during these years, especially from interacting with customers and end, user of the, end users of the, of the mills. And then second question again about partnerships. Um, the mini grid uh, developers uh, that was mentioned, but what other partnerships you have created with uh, local organizations or, or or international partners that have been critical to your success? And actually, there's also one one question from the audience that you can maybe include. So the question is: Do you re redesign the existing diesel mills if replacing what happens to the existing one? Okay, cool. Um, sure, I'm just trying to see that where that question is, but I any I can't see it. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, look, first, just a just a kind of maybe recap or or just uh, you know a couple of points here. I think you know with the um, you know kind of heard from from Peter and Ricardo about you know kind of really you know site like uh, site location and 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 really looking for sites where that they can scale and do this kind of more uh, you know in, in industrial kind of commercial uh kind of processing i suppose we kind of work at the 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 other end of of commercial agro processing which is much more at the uh smallholder level much more at kind of uh village level much more at kind of staple food and and subsistence level so we're not really, you know, we're, we're not looking at, at, at um, value addition on high value food products. Um, you know, this is this is the staples that people survive on that we deal with. Um, look, you know, I think there's also, it's, we can recognize that you, you look at every, um, you know, developed or medium developed or whatever uh, uh, country across the world and seeing how agriculture has generally evolved from very small scale um, production to, Kind of more industrial scale to much more streamlined agricultural value chains, and you know that's inevitable here um, in, in Kenya and, and the continent also. Um, you know, but we, I, I think it's important to recognise we, you know, that, that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen fast. So if the, if there's not better solutions provided to smallholder farmers for the for the next two, you know, one, two, three cycles of generations, then they're going to get get left behind in this in this process and be um, reliant on on you know old inefficient and expensive technology. Um, look, we took a you know we we learned an awful lot over the over the years. We started retrofitting um, off the shelf mills um, that essentially doesn't make sense because they're not uh, efficient enough. They're not fit for purpose. Um, you know, to the to the uh, question that came in, yeah, we. Um, you know, trying to trying to retrofit a, a, what would otherwise be a diesel mill with a with a solar electric mill. Um, we, you know, there's going to be cases where that will work, but but as a company, you know, selling hardware like this, we have to go to scale and we have to make a product that is kind of replicable um, a, a, in a lot of contexts. Um, so, you know, we've we've kind of gone the other way. From we started with larger machines and we've we've kind of come down the funnel into smaller and smaller machines, but at the same time, making more and more efficient machines. Um, and to get where we, we are on our kind of cost performance um, kind of mix, you know, we've, as a hardware developer in the space, we've had, we, we've taken some pretty, you know, extreme measures to get where we are. Like we, we have developed our own electric, very specialized electric motor. Um, you know, we are, we're assembling that motor in Kenya because as, as strange as it sounds, there is not an electric motor on the market that is fit for purpose for the kind of small, efficient mill that we, we have to make. 
um, you know, we've also had to develop a, a custom motor driver for that mill and, uh, and a PCB to govern the whole thing and an industry first automatic feed control mechanism. So, you know, this, this is complicated hardware. We, we, we can't just go to the, the Canton Fair or, or one of these trade shows and, and pick something off the shelf and say to our OEM manufacturer, can you just tweak that here or there? You know, we are really um, designing something from scratch. Um, coming back to your questions, Lada, you know, a couple of things that we found really interesting and, and um, encouraging for us this year was we, you know, we took a deeper dive into market research this year. You know, we'd done a lot over the preceding years, um, but we, we took it to another level and started paying millers uh, across Western Kenya to send us data. Um, you know, and, and that was a really insightful experience. One, we found that, you know, surveying a diesel miller is, is the, the error margins on the, on the information you receive are so great that that, that data is almost useless. Um, and we, we also, the, and the big takeaways for us is that we learned that diesel mills spend 40% of their revenues on fuel and uh, maintenance costs. So, you know, we, our, our solar mill can, can um, outcompete a diesel mill almost by, um, you know, from a profitability perspective, you know, 70% more profitable per, per unit of volume milled. And what oh, that sorry, can sorry do- Sorry, can I, can I just, uh quickly interrupt we're kind of uh running a little bit late so if you can wrap up so we will have time for for peter, or okay, peter sure, also sure, sure. sorry yeah anyway look, i know, so I know you're getting excited yeah. of course <laughs> they're, way, they're way more profitable they're way more efficient on mini grids um that means a lot when when mini grid developers have to charge a higher kind of unsubsidized tariff that means a lot for the customer and their profitability um also no inrush for mini grids and look, there's a lot more I could say, but uh, look, I'll, I'll, in the, uh, for the sake of time, I'll pause there. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so you're a uh, first mover in the sector, kind of. So uh, um, it's always, it's always a difficult position. But then let's move on to Peter. Uh, I hope at least our speakers uh, can uh, bear with some extra minutes over time. But um, um, after after Peter's um, last uh, points, then I think we can wrap up quite quickly. So um, Peter uh, Mandulis has a very very unique business model, and it's a truly integrated approach. Also, and you have BioWise Digester that provides electricity for the anchor client in agro processing and and also to households through this uh, microgrid. And then you have uh, the system can provide uh, produce cooking biogas for institutional users and households and there's a, a range of other services too so uh, definitely this cannot be done all alone so what are the the key partnerships uh, that are needed in this uh, circular motor to make it work thank you very much Lotte. thank you colleagues yes so it's helps to work with partners and one of one of our main partners actually is um, was seeded out of Mandulis. It's called Repal, and Repal is our agricultural value addition partner that works directly with smallholder farmers, connecting them to markets, and you know make sure they are able to get the prices they need, making sure their processing is done to the right quality, and so on and so forth. So what basically happens is we go into each community with Repal able to seed that ag processing and value addition and also be able to show an example to the community uh, of what can be done with the electricity and so what what happens is since our main anchor client is able to use the majority of the electricity that we do generate we're able to bring that price really really low and other partners can now come on board and be able to access grid prices off grid and with that low cost it's great you know other ag processing companies are able to you know plug in other startups that work in that ecosystem can also plug in uh, we also work closely with ngos in refugee hosting districts as uh, you know for, for example uh, ngos and, and ngos as well we work closely with the fao for for example that especially in the refugee uh, hosting areas we work closely with acted as well and and a few others so what 
what happens is we all know, you know, the saying that they say, take the village to raise a child in, in Africa, but it takes an ecosystem, you know, to lift up a village. And that's the approach you basically go for. So uh, there's numerous partners. There's obviously a few key, key partners to help keep those prices low to enable more partners to even plug in. And when we think of the different things that come out of that, um, of course, you've got a electricity, you know, that uh, manual is supplies to repile and, and, and the community. But what comes out of the particular projects that we're scaling up with the support of EV Africa and now with the support of the FMO as well is basically agricultural waste in and out comes electricity, biogas, um, you know, and also biofertilizers to the communities around. But with everything being distributed, as my colleague said earlier, through electric vehicles, and uh, it helps us create a fully carbon, you know, neutral ecosystem where there's no use of fossil fuels at all along the entire value chain. And um, that's only possible because of the ecosystem, because of the, because of the partnership, and because of that approach, which says let's keep that those prices as low as feasibly possible, and let's create that kind of environment so that the smallholder farmers can make as much of an improvement in their lives as your larger farmers are doing around the place and access the very same markets. Because ultimately, you know, um, we're all we're all happier. Mini grids can sell more electricity when our customers do better. You know, and mini grid partners can also do better when our customers do better. So when we lift each other up and we uplift the whole ecosystem, the economy does better as well. And when the grid arrives late, later on, it's much easier to switch to the grid when we've already started at the mini grid level to be operating at the same tariffs as the grid does. And with, with, with partners like EP Africa and uh, you know colleagues like the colleagues we have on this call and others that EP Africa is, is supporting, we can work together to really um, you know, uh, transform what we know as uh, the dark continent to one that shines with light all around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was uh, perfectly put to to wrap up this discussion, and and we're very much looking forward to seeing your EP funded project roll out um, next year. Um, Thank you. So yes, the, the time is up. We are already a couple of minutes over time. Thank you so much to our great speakers and and also to our audience who um, uh, who joined today. Very inspiring insights and, and lessons learned. By the way, we didn't receive any any more questions. There was one about uh, other bottlenecks, but I think you already all of you discussed um, discussed that. And there was one one feedback from the audience. Hats off to you guys, Peter, Matt, and Ricardo. Um, so. Um, Tomorrow is the final day of the EP Africa Knowledge Week. If you haven't registered yet, you can you can do it um, through our website, for example. So the session is called Growing Beyond Grant Funding. And we will have our head of portfolio and finance, Lauri, moderating the session. And then my colleague, Chris, um, will be providing the first glimpses of our next industry study. And then we have two EP project developers, Ensol and PowerLive, who will be sharing their experiences in grant funding. And, and then we will also have two investors, um, Trump Impact and Lions Head Global Partners, um, joining too. Then at the end, we will award the project of the year 2021 among the following shortlisted companies. So Jazza Energy, PowerLive Zimbabwe, Sistema Bio and Zembo are the are the, the great finalists. So now, thank you all for joining today. We hope to see you tomorrow again and uh, have a good rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Lotta. Thank you.